Welcome back to the Zero Hour. Joining us now is Celinda Lake. Celinda is one of the Democratic Party's and the progressive movement's leading political strategists and tacticians. She was Joseph Biden's pollster in 2008. She is known for cutting-edge research on issues including the economy, health care, the environment, and education, all issues dear to our hearts here on this program. We know her and her work. We respect her, and we're delighted to have you on the program. So, Linda, thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'm delighted now, uh, to be here. Well, then we're all delighted. And... <laughs> And listen, I wanted to have you on, uh, well, we, as as you, some folks have heard, there's an election coming up, and you did some uh, fascinating polling recently uh, for our sponsor, as a matter of fact, Social Security Works, on the, topic, on the topic of expanding Social Security. What do voters think about the idea of expanding Social Security benefits? and uh, perhaps uh, taxing millionaires, uh, lifting the payroll tax cap to do it. And you came up with some extremely compelling results. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what you thought that meant in a broader political context, too. So would you mind just uh, briefly summarizing for our audience what you found? So voters overwhelmingly favor expanding Social Security. And uh, they also... uh, totally separately, uh, but in addition linked, uh, completely support lifting the cap. In fact, most Americans have no idea there is a cap, and they think of this not as a tax increase, but rather closing a loophole, because people think that Bill Gates and uh, Celinda Lake should pay the same Social Security taxes, uh, and people also believe that... Um, just like you pay on Medicare all the way up, you should pay on Social Security all the way up. So this is a wildly, wildly favorite proposal, both to make the system and can keep the system solvent, and then to ex- uh, expand Social Security benefits. Retirement is becoming a major, major concern in this country. It's the number one economic concern for women. And if you're a married woman, you start worrying about retirement at age 55. If you're unmarried, you start worrying about it at age 35. Um, So this is tapping into a major anxiety out there. And people love the Social Security program. Uh, everyone in America thinks this is a fantastic program. And even people who think it won't be there for them, the younger generation, absolutely in support of uh, protecting the program and expanding the program. Well, if I can jump in for a second here, you've, you've touched on several demographics, and I think that the demographics of this issue uh, fascinate me because you have an off-year election where turnout is so critical. You're talking about Social Security as an issue, first of all, that involves a core part of the Democratic base, the base they should want to see turning out for this election, younger people who strongly support the idea. Um, and you're talking about women who have been a key demographic uh, for the Democrats and and uh, who the Democrats desperately need to appeal to and reach out to. Uh, and then in your own research, what I found uh, in reading it is a seven... This seems like the issue from heaven. We're constantly hearing about uh, the need to reach independence and undecided. Well, your report says that 73% of independents independents support the expansion of Social Security. 73% of Republicans support it. And when it comes to the turnout question, 90% of Democrats support the idea and 75% strongly support it. So uh, you know the uh, movers and shakers of the Democratic Party better than I do. Um, Why aren't they all over this? I can't imagine, to be honest with you. And the client, I think people have no idea that it's so wildly supported. Uh, Many candidates are all over it. Uh, Senator Tester, Senator Begich have introduced, and these, they don't, they come from Montana and Alaska. These are not raving liberal states, but they are, uh, have introduced legislation years ago to lift the cap. Um, Senator John Walsh from Montana, Senator Sherrod Brown, Senator Al Franken, uh, Senator Debbie Stabenow have talked about supporting uh, expanding uh, Social Security. But I think the major thing is that people think, well, people are tax sensitive. They don't want to, uh, they don't think that we should be increasing government spending. And what they don't realize is that's not how people think about Social Security. 
Right. And I wanted to get to that because in addition to your own research, you obviously follow other research on this issue. We're talking with Celinda Lake, president of Lake Research Partners. And uh, one of the things that uh, strikes me about this issue is, for example, you talked about uh, they think voters are tax sensitive, but uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the National Academy of Social Insurance polling, which show, I mean, you may have done you may have done it for all I know, but yeah, I don't know. I'm very familiar with it. And that said that people were not only supportive of expanding Social Security benefits and protecting and securing Social Security, but they'd pay more themselves, not just taxing yeah. millionaires or lifting the cap. So this is an immensely popular program that seems to be uh, it, it seems to soar in popularity in all demographics, in all uh, political orientations. You just have to get out of the beltway before you see it. That's right. And the other thing, actually, that we're finding is uh, I think that candidates and elected officials, particularly in the Beltway, think of this as another policy, this is another program. That's not how real people think about it. Real people think of Social Security as what we call a valence issue. It's a core value. Hmm. And it's hmm. bipartisanly held. You want to look for bipartisan uh, consensus in this polarized era? Expanding Social Security is a bipartisan issue. And what we found is that uh, 92% of Democrats, 75% of independents, and 69% of Republicans support increasing Social Security benefits and paying for that increase by having the wealthy Americans pay the same rate for Social Security as everyone else. And people think this is just like the best policy they've ever heard of. This is better than sliced bread um, because uh, it is something that in, embodies fairness, and a very, very, very popular program. Well, Celinda Lake, I don't want to put you on the spot here because you work with the leadership of the Democratic Party. You were the pollster for Joe Biden, who's done very well for himself since then. And uh, I, but I guess I, I get back to this question of bafflement. Is it that there is just a, an economic uh, consensus among party leaders and media leaders that we have to cut this program instead of expanding it, and that's all there is to it. I mean, you do have the exceptions, the people you mentioned. You have Senator Tom Harkin uh, proposing an, an expansion in benefits. Yeah. You have Senator yeah. Elizabeth Warren signing on with this. You have the, you know, the leadership of the Congressional Progressive Caucus and so on. But by and large, we see the leadership of the Democratic Party dragging its feet on this one. And uh, at best, and um, is, is there any sign? And this is look. This is an off-year election. They lost the house in the last off-year election. You'd think they'd be pulling out off all the stops. Uh, is there any chance that you see that they they might turn around on this issue and and come out fighting this way? You know, I wish they would, and this would be a great distinction uh, to draw. I think that uh, you still have a real nervousness in the poli political class, and that includes the elected officials and the consultants, about anything that has the title expanding next to it. But I think what you will see is at the end of these campaigns, a record number of campaigns running Social Security as an issue uh, to win these campaigns in 2014. And what I thought was very interesting today is that there was an ad launched in the main gubernatorial race, not a federal race, but a gubernatorial race on Social Security and Medicare. So I think you're going to see a record number of campaigns ending on this issue. And what I hope it does is set up a platform where people will think about being bolder than just protecting it and understanding how supportive people are of expanding it. You know, uh, I hope so, too, but uh, there's not a heck of a lot of time left, is there? I mean, we're talking about an election in roughly six weeks or so, and um, we got a light of fire under some folks. I'm not going to put you completely on the spot and ask you how you think the election is looking, because I think that at this point, uh, you know, I mean, we have other people, of, uh, you know, the Nate Silvers of the world are probably worrying about that. You're probably worrying about being more activist. I mean, if, if you want to predict, predict. But I, I guess my question for you would be more along the lines of, um, uh, is there any information at all about a uh, shift in the kind of likely voters? I mean, we saw youth, vo uh, uh, youth turnout in 2010. Uh, if I recall correctly, was lower than it was in 2006 before any uh, young voters had heard of or become excited by a candidate named 
Barack Obama. So I guess the question is, are we getting any sort of sense of what turnout might look like, of what, uh, uh, you know, some of these other decisive factors might be shaping up to be, and what people might proactively do about it in the next six weeks besides Social Security? Well, what we do know are several things. We know that turnout looks abysmal from the Democratic perspective. We need to get young people out, Latinos out, African Americans out, and unmarried women out. We know, secondly, that older non-college women, independent women, will be the decisive vote in 2014. They will determine these elections, and right now they make up a disproportionate number of the undecided votes. They are wildly, wildly in favor of Social Security, both protecting it and expanding it. So I think that you're going to see, and, you know, yes, we're only six weeks out from the election. On the other hand, from the way most of us look at it, that's like four cycles of ads. Um, and so I think you're going to see a lot of um, attention paid to the issue, perhaps not the expanding part, because people are not going to be risk takers six weeks out from an election, and they still perceive this to be a risk, even though the data would suggest it's not risky at all. Uh, but uh, you are going to see a record number of ads, I think, on Social Security and Medicare. Well, you know, I, and I, I wanted to get to that point, too. I'm glad you brought that up. We're speaking with Celinda Lake of Lake Research Partners about the polling and the, and the politics of Social Security and of expanding Social Security. You know, we saw this, uh, if I were to summarize in my own way what I think the last decade's been for the politics of Social Security, Republicans tried to privatize in 2005. They got hammered in the polls over that. It was a, really hurt them. And you Democrats at one point had, had, if I recall correctly, a 20-point advantage on the issue. This, As you say, and I love the fact that you said it's a valence issue, it's a values issue, it's a core issue. People vote based on uh, their feelings about Social Security. 63% of the people you polled said they would be more likely to vote for a member of Congress who voted to increase Social Security. So Democrats had this huge in I lead. They squandered it, perhaps with Obama's deficit reduction talk. As sweeping Social Security into it. For whatever reason, by 2010, that was gone. Uh, and and you had a 2010 election where the Republicans campaigned on Social Security and Medicare. Uh, total fraud, but, I mean, effective. Uh, they said they had a senior's bill of rights. Don't let the uh, Democrats cut Medicare. They, they've been obfuscati obfuscating issues of provider reimbursement on Medicare to make it sound like <laughs> Democrats are cutting Medicare. They've been, you know, so now we're seeing, for example, example in the arkansas race uh you see i am a political nerd um <laughs> you see senator Pryor's opponents you know saying that he voted uh, yeah. you know to cut it to entitlements so uh, yes I, I i'm certain that in the four uh, i love that you brought up there four cycles of ads to go but uh aren't we going to see ads from both sides claiming that the other is uh, don't democrats need a a, a handy ha a way to distinguish themselves and it wouldn't uh, I know you're saying that they're too nervous or scared or whatever to um, to uh, latch on to expand Social Security but how else can they at this point uh, with four cycles to go distinguish themselves from their opposition well I think they will distinguish themselves on Social Security and Medicare and the good news is those ads attacking Democrats on Medicare and Social Security aren't very effective, and they're the least mm. effective this cycle that they have been in several cycles. Because Democrats have one of the bigger advantages on Social Security and Medicare that they have had in several cycles. Um, one of the things that's really important here also is that seniors, for the first time in uh, several cycles, are giving Democrats the advantage on Social Security and Medicare. So I think that that emboldens Democrats. I think also for a while what was very um, problematic was you had the Democratic president talking about changing CPI and, right. you know, age, uh, changing the age of retirement, uh, that we have to reform entitlement. And then that put Democrats in a very bad position of having to disagree both with their own president and the Republicans. Now the administration doesn't, uh, it has backed off of that agenda, uh, pushed in part by leadership from the the Democrats in Congress. And I think um, you can see it frees up Democrats to more comfortably draw a really clear distinction. Uh, well, that's that at least is a bit of good news. It, 
If turnout is really the critical issue, and if uh, women, and it sounds like especially single women, but women as a demographic are a critical issue, along with uh, young people and, uh, and uh, Latinos and so on, uh, what's just a quick rundown of a couple other issues that the Democrats might want to be a little bolder on if they want to, uh, you're saying the, the, the outlook, you use the word abysmal, that's not something we, you know that uh, people are going to like to hear. What are some other issues they can use to try to turn that around between now and the, uh, the election? Well, there are three issues, and we just did uh, work for Move On. There are three issues that really emerge in terms of get out the vote. Uh, one is education. Uh, Democrats are very, very upset about cuts in education. Uh, drop-off voters are very upset about cuts in education. They're appalled that people would try to uh, balance the budget on Head Start cuts, for example. Mm -hmm. So that's a very strong issue. A second very strong issue is the so-called war on women and both the reproductive health issues and uh, the economic issues for women, like equal pay, pregnancy discrimination. Now, what's interesting is this is another case where the Republicans are getting much cleverer. And so in response to the Hobby Lobby decision, they've come out with over-the-counter birth control, which sounds good until you're reminded that over-the-counter means you get no reimbursement from your insurance company, while men right. are still getting Viagra fully covered by their insurance companies. Um, so how does that make sense? Uh, and then the third issue that really stands out is populist middle-class economics and tying tax fairness to good economic policies for the middle class, including protecting Social Security, frankly, uh, which is seen as an economic issue, uh, increasing minimum wage, et cetera. So, we, so it, it's not like there is a shortage of uh, of of key issues and core issues, it sounds like they're all essentially economic issues. I mean, including uh, uh, in including women's health issues, which are yeah. uh, so. So it sounds like what the Democratic Party needs, if it can pull itself together, is something like an economic bill of rights for the middle class, for women, for uh, minorities, for young people. Um, but are you seeing or hearing? anybody out there who's trying to pull these issues together into a coherent narrative? Well, no. And part of the problem with that, honestly, is that we don't have a co coherent negative coming from the president. And real events are interceding because of the foreign policy. But we right. desperately need the president, the vice president, to, to make the broader economic case and to get get back on domestic policy. This focus on foreign policy, which real live events is dictating, is, is very damaging uh, because the party's divided on the foreign policy stuff. People right. actually trust Republicans more than Democrats on foreign policy, which is hard to imagine, but true. And um, what real people and drop-off voters are focused on is economic policy. So we really need to get back to that. Um, but, you know, uh, so it's very hard for an individual congressional candidate or, frankly, even an individual Senate candidate to have the resources to lay out that kind of coherent umbrella. Right. You know, uh, and in the couple minutes we had left, I just wanted to run something by you that popped into my head, which is a dangerous thing to do, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, you know who did a great job of defending Social Security in a coffee shop in Virginia not long before the 2012 election who to my mind would be the ideal guy for this would be your old client Joe Biden oh, I, um, completely. I so agree with you and he really gets it he knows how to talk about this stuff he is one of the best I mean you know people tease him about this and that but <laughs> I, I, I've never seen anybody better at uh, just kind of laying out these middle class That's ordinary right. people's issues he did such a great job in that coffee shop to, and and he was decisive he said you know I, you you have my word there will be no cuts to social security and so on and he ju he just has a way of doing it um any chance that somebody right. we know any chance that somebody we know might whisper in his ear uh, and maybe get the uh, president's okay for him to spend the next month as a champion of uh, economic fairness? Boy, I hope so. I don't have any idea, but I hope so. And I, hopefully uh, his, his folks will hear it from your show because I couldn't agree with you more.
Joe, we're counting on you. And um, you heard it here first. Mr. Vice President, we need you on this one. Um, so, uh, Celinda Lake, uh, President of Lake Research Partners, any uh, final thoughts for us as to what people should be looking at in uh, races around the country in the next six weeks? In terms of? Just what people ought to be looking for in terms of messaging, in terms oh. of uh, issues. Is there anything people should keep their eyes and ears open for, or is it just pretty much uh, keep your ear to the ground and hope for the best? No, I think, uh, good question. So I think watch the Social Security issue, because I think you'll see Democrats use it in record numbers. Two, watch what women are doing. Uh, right now, mm. men are Republican than women are in most of these close races. And women make up more of the undecided votes. So it's up to the women. And watch what the women are doing. And then third... Watch, and I would urge your listeners, get involved in any kind of get-out-the-vote effort you can. Right now, the get-out-the-vote numbers look worse than 2010. We mm. have to turn turnout up, and we have to do it with message. People aren't going to just respond to driving a van up to their door. We're going to have to have some messages out there that get people out to vote. Well, I... Uh- this is this is uh, uh, great information, a great analysis, not a cheerful one, but certainly uh, a, a call to arms and uh, one that reinforces the message we've, we've all been trying to send for a long time, which is that economic fairness isn't just the right policy, it's the right politics. So, uh, Celinda Lake, uh, president of Lake Research Partners, thanks so much for joining us on the Zero Hour. Thank you so much, and thank you for your knowledge and your terrific listeners. Oh, well, th- well we, re- we appreciate it, and we hope you come back and join us someday. Talk to you soon. All right. Thank you. I am Richard R.J. Eskow, and we will be back on the Zero Hour.